Okay. Um, so we're going to continue looking at the implications of Euroson's lemma and his metricization theorem. So it turns out that uh, the following are equivalent definitions of normal. So we start off with a T1 space, so you know, points are closed. So there's a normal definition of that normal, which is that we can separate closed sets by open sets. And so uh, we saw number two when we looked at Urison's lemma that um, the property of separating disjoint closed sets by a continuous function. So Urison's lemma is that one implies two, and it's trivial that two implies one. So being able to separate by a continuous function is stronger than being able to separate it by a uh, open set. And so what we want to have a look today is at the Tietze extension theorem, which says that if you've got any closed set of a space and a continuous function from that closed set to the reals, then you can extend it to a continuous function uh, to the whole space X to the reals. Okay. So we're going to look at the uh, Tietze extension theorem, which basically says that, uh, that one implies three. Okay. Uh, so that you can do this in a normal, and it's actually kind of straightforward. I'm doing notes. Um, that three implies two, right? Because all you've got to do is if you've got your space X, well, you've got two closed sets A and uh, let's call it B and C, okay? Then we just call B union C A. And so we do the uh, continuous function that is zero on B and one on B. Uh, C, since they're disjoint, it's a continuous function. And so the um, Tietze extension theorem says that we can now extend it to a whole a whole theorem such that it's zero on B, one on C. And that's exactly what Urison's lemma is. And don't worry about, you might think, well, uh, we could always make it between zero and one, right? Because if you're given any function from X to R, you can turn it into a function from X um, to a closed interval, right? Uh, let's say minus one, one, by, um, by looking at the function that goes from R to R, where R of X equals x if absolute value of x is less than one and it's equal to x divided by mod x. The mod of x is, I mean, so you can always turn a function, just you can, a continuous function uh, into a bounded one just by, uh, by a procedure like that. So anyway, so, so, so we can make this, uh, we can the three implies uh, two. And so that means all the following are equivalent after we've proved uh, Tietze's extension theorem. Um, now, firstly, obviously, <clears throat> we need the subspace to be closed, right? Because if an, for an open space, consider, you know, one on X on zero, one, there's no way that we can extend that to, to a continuous function for the whole because we've got to have the limit points in our space A to be able to, to talk about continuous functions. Um, so when you first look at it, 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 it's like trivial for R, right? Because if we have a function on um, a closed interval in R,
right? So if I give you a, a function which is defined on the closed interval, then it's easy to expand it to all of R, right? You just make it constant at the end point. So it doesn't seem anything big, right? But normality is needed. So for example, remember our friend, the Sorgen Frey plane, which had as a, so what did it look like? So remember the anti-diagonal, so open sets are just single, single points are open sets on the anti-diagonal. So you can make any function whatsoever you like on the anti-diagonal and it'll be continuous, right? Um, but then open sets outside the anti-diagonal kind of look like, kind of look like that. And so, you know, taking a function, for example, which is zero on the rationals and one on the irrationals, and extending that to a continuous function on the whole spaces. So normality is needed. Okay, so the Tietze extension theorem. Um, so a little bit of history. So it was first, uh, a form of it was first done by Brouwer which was, he did it for like um, RN. So uh, Brouwer is a, uh, is a Dutch mathematician. He's kind of early, he's important in the early history of topology. Um, some people call him the father of topology. So the, uh, he's most famous for the Brouwer fixed point theorem. Have you heard that? So the Brouwer fixed point theorem says that um, if you've got a function, continuous function from the disk to itself, it must have a fixed point. But it's a topological theorem, right? So that means anything which is homeomorphic to a disk. So if you come up with some wild space like this, and you say you've got a function from this to itself, it has to have a fixed point, which is kind of, a bit startling, and it's one of those theorems where you need topology to, to, to prove it. Um, it's pretty, pretty neat. Um, so what Tietze did was he was an Austrian mathematician. Uh, he proved it for metric spaces, and then when Urasan came up with his famous 1925 paper where he gave Urasan's lemma and the Urasan metricization theorem, he he, he gave it for normal spaces. So, so some people call it the Brouwer Tietze Urasan theorem, but a lot, most people just call it the Tietze extension theorem. Um, so the idea is you have a normal space and a closed subspace of that normal space, then any continuous map of that closed subspace into the closed interval can be extended to a continuous map of all of x into that closed interval. And the, the second version of it is any continuous map from A into R can be extended to a continuous map into all, all uh, of x into R. Um, so before we do the proof, Here's kind of like a, a sketch of it. Um, so first we consider this, the case where uh, we've got a map from our closed space uh, to a, a closed interval. And so this is where the Urasan lemma comes in. So uh, using the Urasan lemma, um, we can uh, come up, we can construct a bounded continuous function on all of X which approximates uh, the function on A. So of course, approximates has to be put in um, uh, inverted commas. So this 
So there's something epsilon e going on here, which we'll get into. Um, and so what happens then is using this, this, uh, this kind of lemma that comes from Eurison lemma saying that we can construct a continuous function, we can then construct a sequence of continuous functions and the idea is that these continuous functions approximate our given function and they converge uniformly to something. And so uh, the fact that it unif uh, converges uniformly means it has to converge to a continuous function. It's defined on all of X since the, 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 the Functions in the sequence are defined all x, and um, since it, since they're approximating uh, our function f on our closed set A in the limit, they actually are f on the closed set A. And then it's after we do that, it's fairly straightforward then. Uh, to do the case where f is a function to any of the rules. Okay, so that's the plan. Let's get to it. So here is the key lemma that is in the first thing. So if we have a normal space, a closed subspace, and say we're given a continuous function from A, into the closed interval minus R, R. So R is just any real number. Then there exists a continuous function from X to R such that um, G of X is bounded by R on three. But it's a bounded function. And this is where we get into the approximation of F. Um, actually, F minus G is bounded by 2R on 3 for all points in our closed space A. Okay, so this is this is kind of this is the lemma that we use to construct functions in our sequence. And the proof is by an actual construction. Okay, so the first thing we do is we divide our interval minus r to r into three equal inter uh, intervals. So of width two r on three. And then we let B and C be inverse images of those closed intervals. Okay, so since we started off with a continuous function, the inverse image of a closed set is going to be closed. So let's call the sets B and C. Uh, so they are closed disjoint subsets of A. And since A is closed in X, B and C are also closed in X. Okay, and they're disjoint. Right? So we've got closed disjoint subsets of a normal space. So now we can use Eurison's lemma. So by Eurison's lemma, we can uh, come up with a continuous function um, going from X over the whole space. And um, we're going to make it go from minus R on three to R on three, where it's going to equal minus R on three on, on B and plus R on three on C.
So the whole thing with Eurosong's lemma is you know, we can we can adapt it so that it can go to a closed interval or we can make it go to a whole interval, whatever. And we can make it any closed interval we want just by specifying what the values are at the closed sets that can determine what the endpoints are. Okay. And so just by construction, A instantly holds, right? Because it goes from minus R on three to R on three. So, so A holds. So all we've got to do now is show that B holds, that somehow um, G approximates F, approximate in a, in a very loose way. And here's the picture that we have. So remember, we're given F. So the way this works, right, this is the space X, uh, which could be anything. So don't be confused by the horizontal thing, thinking it's like R, it can be any kind of thing. But the vertical axis is R, so that, that's true. So the vertical axis is true. So F is anything that kind of wanders along, gives us values of R doing uh, point X. And then G, right, is uh, minus R on three on B, R on three in C, and then anything in between there. But it has to go, when it goes from, yeah, so it has to look like that. And then you just go through the three cases, right? So, right, so this is, this is kind of A kind of here. So if A can either be in B, can be in C, or it can be neither. If A is in B, then, right, we know that G of A is equal to R on three, and F of A has to lie in, uh, did I do this wrong? Oh, that is B, sorry. If, if A lies in B, then G is equal to minus R on three, and F of A has to lie in I1. In either case, the difference between the two is at most 2R on three. If A is in C, then G of A equals R3, equals R on three, and F of A has to lie somewhere in I3. So again, the difference between the two is at most 2R on three. And then if A is in neither B nor then C, then G of A has to lie between minus R on three and R on three. And F of A has to lie between minus R on three and R on three. In either case, the most it can be is two R on three apart. Okay, so that's what we mean by approximate, the very rough approximation. But here is the, the key thing. If we now look at F minus G, that is now going to be a continuous function from A to a smaller interval. And that's just the key point. That means just we, if we keep on doing again and again and again, we're going to get a better and better approximation. And so that's what we do. Okay, so let's do, so since we have that lemma, we can use that lemma, let's, let's use it. Okay, so, um, so let's prove the first part. So that's a, the first part is when we have a continuous map from 
from our close set A to a closed interval. And with our loss of generality, we can assume that our closed interval is minus one pi. If it's not, we can just compose it with a function that goes from the closing of A, B to the closing of minus one minus. So we can fit it to what we see. So the claim is that can be extended to a continuous map of all of X into minus one one. Okay. So by the lemma, we can then, so we're now going to use the lemma that we had before with R equal to, to one. And if that's the case, we come up with a G then, which is bounded by one third and, and F and G will differ by F by two thirds. G one. Now we consider F minus G one. That's a continuous function from our closing interval from our close set A to the closing interval minus two to two thirds. So we apply the lemma again, and that means we get a function uh, G two. Right, and G2, right, so everything has been squished down by a factor of two thirds. So G, uh, G2 goes from X to minus two ninths to plus two ninths. And that should be F minus G1 minus G1A minus G2A. Sorry for that in there. That is now going to be the error term is now two thirds times two thirds for all A in our quotes at A. And so we apply the lemma again to this and we just keep on doing this. And this is the general case, right? So in the general case, we have defined real value functions G1 through Gn, which are defined on all defined on all X, such that when we restrict ourselves to A, F minus the sum of the G's is less or equal to two thirds Dn. Okay, so then we can apply the lemma to this function, F minus the sum of the G's, to get our Gn plus one, which is going to be a function from X to even smaller interval, right? With the difference from the sum of the G's now from F less than or equal to two thirds to the N plus one. And that's, and that's true for all A in our closed set A. So we've got this kind of standard uh, sequence of things which are bounded on the whole of the subspace. As, and it's important, of course, that it's bounded on the entire subspace because that's what gives us uniform continuity, uniform convergence. Okay, and so then we just proceed by induction. And so that defines a function Gn for all n, each one getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And then we just define G to be the sum, the infinite sum of all these GNs. 
Is that okay? So we've got to check that this actually works. Okay, so we defined a function. So the first thing we're going to do is show that it's well defined. Okay, it's well defined because this is a convergent, going to be a convergent series. Um, because we can, pick, can compare it with the geometric series. Okay. And, and so by the, I guess what is it, the comparison test, we get that that's a convergent, uh, convergent series for all X. So therefore it's well-defined. Secondly, we note that G is continuous. Um, so if we just let Sn be the partial sums of the G of the sequence, um, the function G has to be continuous because the Sn's are continuous because they're the finite sum of continuous functions and they converge, converge uniformly to G. And that's easy to see, right? Because uh, what's this? This is kind of Cauchy thing or something. So for K greater than N, if we look at the difference between SK of X and SN of X, right? This is this, is this um, kind of tail here. We can actually go ahead and bound it by the geometrics, you know, about the bound, which bounds all the GNs, right? So then we can turn this in, this is going to be lesser when we go to infinity. And so this is, this is a geometric series. We know what that sum is, it's two thirds to the N. And so, um, right, so if we fix N and let K go to infinity, Uh, we get there, and now we let n go to infinity, that's going to go to zero. So, so when we take k to infinity, we get g of x. So g minus sn is bounded by two thirds n, and now we can just let n go to infinity, and that's where we get our uniform convergence. What else do we have to check? We have to check that it's equal to, um, we have to check that G equals F on A. Well, that's simple. Uh, oops, I forgot the less than. Again, we can bound this difference by two thirds to the N. And so we see that point wise, it's going to, Point-wise, uh, the partial sums of A are going to converge to the value of the function of A. Is that it? And so, oh, finally, we've got to show that we mentioned that G maps X into the closed interval. And there it is. You know, it, it, it because it's everything's bounded, it, it, it converges to some closed interval, and we can just make it minus one, one by composing with that function that I talked about earlier. So that works. So it's just pretty standard advanced calc kind of, kind of proof. Okay, what about doing it for R. Okay. So we want to show that a continuous map from A to R can be extended to a continuous map of, oh, that should be A, of, of X, sorry, into R. 
Okay. So the first point to notice is we can replace R by minus one one because they're homeomorphic. It's a standard, what's the standard way to show R and minus one one? Is it like arctan or something? Or something like that. It's a standard way to do that. Okay, so we can extend F to a to a map that goes to from X to minus one one by the first part. Right, because uh, if f goes to minus one one minus uh, the open interval minus one one, it's contained within the closed interval minus one one. So we can extend it to a map that goes to minus one one. Now we've got to get rid of points that go to minus one and the points that go to one. So we let d be those nuisance points. So G inverse of minus one and G inverse of one. Now, the nice thing about it is, right, uh, they're going, that's going to be, each one of these is going to be a closed set. So the union of them is going to be a closed set. So D is a closed set. So, but again, by the first bit, um, G of A equals F of A, right? Uh, this, this G agrees with F on A, it has to set it to, to minus one once because we're told, right, that F, that F is just a, a function from A to minus one part one. So A is a closed set disjoint from D. So we can apply Urisson's lemma. So by Urisson's lemma, we can have a continuous function from our space X. This time we want to use the closed interval 0, 1. But we want it to be 0 on D and 1 on A. Can you guess what we do next? So we want to get rid of the points. Okay, we want to we want to make sure that the points that are in D don't give us any trouble. So how do we eliminate them? Yep, we multiply the functions. So let our function h be g multiplied by phi. Okay. So it's continuous, right? Because it's the product of continuous functions. It's an extension of F, right? Because at points in A, H of A equals G of A times phi of A, but phi of A equals one. So it equals G of A and G of A, G agrees with F on A, so it equals F. And the last thing is, we've got to show that it maps to minus one, one. Well, it does because this maps to, to uh, you know that this maps to the closed interval minus one, one. This maps to the closed interval zero, one. So the product has to, has to be contained within the closed interval minus one, one, but, We've set it up such that H of D equals zero for, um, for all those nasty points D where, uh, where uh, G is one. And G of X is less than one for all the D that aren't in, in, um, in D. Yay, so it works.
my mistakes again. I think that's all I wanted to do today. Yeah. What do you think of that one? I know it's you so much, I mean, yeah, you're so much love it. It's pretty tough, but these are so, like, I know, it's just, like, these are so straightforward, especially when you've been through advanced calculus and all this. Exactly, so. So all these, like, sums and everything are too boring. I, I think the same thing, too, they're just, like, huh. um, and so, uh, yeah, so we've got one more that's like this. And then we'll uh, get on to Tikhonov's theorem, which is not that straightforward. So that might be. Um, and there's also uh, the stone. Uh, is it Chech? I can't, I can't remember if get just how to say his name. Stone. I don't know. I have to, I have to check that compactification, which is a little bit unusual. So, have you ever done anything with the piatics? Okay. Then we'll just do um, odd interesting things to finish out the course.